everybody. Uh, welcome to our Driftless Dialogue series. My name is Scott Walter. I am Executive Director here at the Kickapoo Valley Reserve, and we're pleased to welcome Susan Carpenter from the UW Arboretum for a Saturday morning lecture on bees. Uh, before we get going, though, I've got a couple things I'd like to share. First, our board recently approved a land acknowledgement statement, so I'll read that. The Kickapoo Reserve Management Board acknowledges that the state and federal lands that comprise the reserve fall within the ancestral homelands of First Nations people, including the Ho-Chunk Nation. We recognize the sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk and other First Nations and will work towards a shared future by continuing to create collaborative opportunities to pr protect and preserve these lands. And we do uh, work very closely with our Ho-Chunk counterparts. The Kickapoo Valley Reserve, for those who haven't been here before or aren't familiar, is about an 8,600 piece, uh, acre piece of property, 1,200 acres the Ho-Chunk actually owns. So we manage the entire property, uh, as I said, very collaboratively. I want to mention also, too, who's been to a Driftless Dialogue presentation in the past, Ben, Joe, yeah. But we have some new people, welcome. Uh, the Driftless Dialogue series, which normally occurs on the third Wednesday of each month, today is a special day, um, is brought to you by a grant through the Ralph E. Newsom Kickapoo Valley Reforestation Fund, administered through the UW-Madison College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. So they provide the funding. We also work very closely with our, our friends group and providing snacks and coffee, things along those lines. So thanks to those folks. So I'll introduce Susan very briefly and then hand the microphone over to her. Susan Carpenter is the native plant garden curator and gardener at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arboretum. Since 2003, she has worked with students and community volunteers to maintain and monitor a four-acre garden representing the plant communities of southern Wisconsin. Four-acre garden, if you can imagine that. She also leads a conservation project that involves students and the public in documenting and studying native bumblebees, including the endangered rusty-patched bumblebee, uh, Bombus affinis. A graduate of Stanford University, Susan earned her MS in Botany and MS in Science Education at UW-Madison. Her professional interests include plant ecology, ecological restoration, pollinator conservation, and science education. So join me in welcoming Susan. How's that for volume? Perfect. Good. Okay. Thank you. Just gonna put that in my pocket then, I guess. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for inviting me to um, speak today. Um, this is a topic I just love to um, talk about, so <laughs> I um, will uh, have a presentation. I hope it fits within your time frame. Uh, I will, any questions that anyone has, either today or if you want to follow up, I'm easily found on the Arboretum website, susan.carpenter at wisc.edu. Um, this is part of a, uh, this was arranged through Badger Talks, which is a terrific program at UW Madison where um, UW speakers are able to either virtually or in person present for um, the citizens of the state. And we're really glad to do it. Um, so, I want to start out with a couple of, um, with two strands that have brought me to being able to be here and uh, share with you uh, what I've learned and hopefully inspire you to uh, go from, you know, maybe take a similar journey. Maybe you're already on a journey of being interested in bumblebees and uh, being a monitor or being um, involved in some other field, but uh, two strands that I want to draw together for you. 
Um, so, and I don't know if it would be possible to lower the lights. I, I mean, I don't know how, from over here it looks, it looks um, dull. Maybe it looks sharp from your point of view. Is it okay? Okay. Is that better? Okay. Um, I can just look at them on the screen too. So I just want to make the point, and this is uh, a pretty simple point since I'm a native plant gardener, that um, native plant gardens or native plantings are equivalent of pollinator habitat. I was a native plant gardener before I got interested in bumblebees, before I got inspired by bumblebees. And so, but what I noticed when we came, when we, uh, when I was, when I came to the Arboretum, we didn't have a native plant garden, and we had an expansion of our visitor center, a huge expansion of the visitor center, and the area around the visitor center was designated as the native plant garden. It was designed by a professional landscape architect, Daryl Morrison, and it represents the plant communities of southern Wisconsin. Uh, he did a terrific job of matching the, garden locations on that site to the soil conditions and the light conditions of the site. And for that, I am incredibly grateful because uh, it's made the gardening much easier than had it been not well matched, we would have been fighting uh, along the way. But I just make the point because when we put the native plants in, really within a few months of putting in a garden such as you're seeing here, um, some of the flower, this isn't the first year, but the flowers are blooming. All of a sudden, there are more birds, there are more spiders, there's more snakes, there's more frogs, there's more everything in that space. And it, it doesn't take long at all. So I just really encourage, um, you know, pollinators are no exception. They're in there as well. Floral visitors of all kinds, so all the different groups. And I'm probably not going to have time to go through some of the other groups that we've observed in these. Um, while we're, while we're studying bumblebees, but um, I'll talk a little bit about how you can learn what more you have in an area just by using the bumblebee monitoring techniques. So this was the first strand that got me, um, you know, of course, interested in pollinators in sort of a more general way. About t 10 or 12 years ago, there was a, a big increase in the amount of public interest and journalist interest and kind of the media being interested in pollinators. So that was kind of brewing. Then the second thing that happened was this. Um, and this is where uh, my training is not in entomology at all. I never took an entomology course, I regret to say. But um, what happened was in, we had a visitor from California uh, visiting the Arboretum and he was taking pictures of bumblebees as he does, as I learned later, he does everywhere he goes. And he took a picture in the native plant garden and he was like, hmm, I didn't meet him at the time, but this is his photo. And uh, he sent the photo to us. He went back to California and he says, I really want to verify this uh, identification before I talk to the people at the Arboretum to, see, to ask the question I'm about to ask. Um, and he verified it as a rusty patch bumblebee. So this is in 2010. And he sent it to us, sent the picture to us, and said, hey, this bumblebee has been lost over most of its range. It has a precipitous decline since about the year 2000, early 2000s. Um, and it's been lost in Canada. We're pretty sure it's lost in Canada, or you know, it hasn't been seen in Canada for, for a long time. And um, have you seen any more of them? I took, you know, he said, I took this picture right outside your visitor center. Have you seen any more of them? And I got a hold of the picture. I opened it up, said, well, it was, that's Mountain Mint. It was taken in August. I know exactly where the picture was taken, but I couldn't answer his question because we hadn't been paying close enough attention to the bumblebees, let alone the different kinds of bumblebees, which I was completely unaware of. So right then, we sort of had to find out, well, how do, how can you monitor bumblebees? Do you have to catch them? Do you have to like sample them? How, how do you, you have to trap them and you know, pin them and look at them? Well, how do you do it? No, you do it with photography. So we started taking pictures and of course right away as I got um, involved in, the, as soon as I got this picture, you know, right away the questions start generating, right? Um, so we were wondering these very basic questions at first or I was wondering to them, which bumblebee species are present at the Arboretum? Once we'd been monitoring a little bit the Arboretum, we're like, well, wait, what about the city of Madison? What about the Mound View grasslands? What about 
um, Kickapoo Valley Reserve? What about, you know, and just kept spreading out and doing surveys around the, mostly the southern part of the state in my case. Um, which plant species are visited by the bumblebees? And are they all the same? Do they all, are they all generalists visiting evenly over across the different plant species? Or do they kind of separate out, you know, do different bumblebees visit different plants? And then, of course, because of uh, being an outreach person, um, how can we promote pollinator conservation education? How does the work that we do with native plant gardening connect with this? And it connects very easily. So those were the two strands that, um, whoops, I knew I would do that. Let's not do that. Got a little pop-up on my screen here. Okay, so today I just want to go over um, a few topics, the bumblebee life cycle and the habitat for bumblebees. So I'll, I'll point out some particular uh, plants that are just kind of interesting in relation to how bumblebees use them and things that you're going to see throughout the season, hopefully. Um, the bumblebee life cycle is important because at different times of year you'll see bumblebees doing different things. And it's important to know what stages you're seeing and what the timing is so that you can interpret um, what what's going on with their population in your area. Uh, some gardening practices that support bumblebees, and this would, these, these practices would not just be supporting bumblebees, but they'll also be supporting other pollinators as well. So uh, bumblebees are not a special category of pollinators necessarily that needs uh, certain unique things, but a lot of the things that you would do for bumblebees would also translate for other pollinators as well. Um, I'm going to talk about monitoring both rare and common bumblebees with photography and how you can learn IDs. Um, the spoiler alert there is you do it one by one. <laughs> it's, it's a gradual process. There's not like a workshop you can take and all of a sudden you're like, okay, I know all my bumblebees now. It won't work that way, but it'll, but it'll go fast and it works by just a gradual process. Uh, and then Bumblebee Brigade is the statewide pro project, which is... Uh, housed at the DNR, and it is in its eighth year now, so half of its life has been during the pandemic, and because of the trainings and the interest early on, and workshops like, or workshops and talks and presentations like this one, um, it turned out that the pandemic did not slow down the progress of that project. It really built both every year since it started, and the pilot project in 2018. So I'm going to tell you how to access that, what resources it has. I won't go into all of that because there's a tremendous amount of resources within the website, and you can learn a lot from it even if you don't have a chance to do an in-person training, of which there won't be very many this year, I don't think. I know of one so far scheduled, but the DNR isn't, um, the staff isn't back up to full capacity uh, for, the, for their trainings yet. I'm going to present this um, diagram, uh, and it, it includes more than bumblebees. So this is a diagram of Wisconsin bee diversity, a very, um, di well, just a diagram. But we have, there are 400 little squares there, and uh, we have actually 400 to 500 species or kinds of wild bees in Wisconsin. That's statewide. So there are little tiny ones, there, there are the big bumblebees, the biggest bumblebees, so size range about there. Um, there are specialists who are only out in the spring, specialists that are only out in the fall. A lot of the bumblebees have a longer flight season, but we still have some early bumblebees, and then bumblebees you'll find later in the season. We have, um, you can see that most of the, uh, just, just the most of the diagram here, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later because I do want to introduce you to some of those other bees. You'll see them when you're looking for bumblebees. But let's just look at the upper corner there. There are 20 squares that are shaded in with uh, darker red and with pink. Those are the 20 bumblebee species for Wisconsin. And for our southern part of the state, and I was just mentioning earlier that um, for this part of the state, you're in a little bit of an overlapping um, place. So there might be there's t roughly 12, 13 species that we see in Madison, but here you might add another northern species that's um, 
or not northern, but like that's more in the central part of the state that we don't see in Madison. So be aware that um, my illustrations will be, my, all my bumblebees will be from Madison. I don't, I, I guess I have a picture of a, I, have, I might have a picture of the one that I'm thinking that you'll probably have here. But that's for you to find out and for you to get out there and get pictures of. So uh, we, when you see, you see that lightly shaded corner there, those are the social or use, uh, the partially social bee species. And all these 85% of the other native bee species are solitary, meaning no colonies no group living situations. They're just single males, females mating, females provisioning eggs, and I'll talk a little bit about those way at the end. Okay, I wanna point out that we have honeybees, obviously, in uh, the state, and they are not a native species, so I have a little square down there at the lower left with a little one in it. There's one species of honeybee. Only one. So all the honeybees that you see in North America are from one species. It's not much diversity. And those are perennial colonies. And they are um, social, of course. So tens of thousands of bees in, within hives. Uh, they go from year to year, if you're lucky, um, and don't have winter kill. Um, and so that is just a separate. They are important agriculturally, or they're used agriculturally. And you'll see them out in the field. Um, so just to keep in mind, there, that's a different category than all these other native bees. So bumblebee life cycle. Um, I'm going to start where we are right now in terms of the life cycle, in terms of our phenology so, or timing. So right now, we are at the point here where the, um, this, is, this is a big future queen bumblebee, and she was underground until about, and this year, until about uh, the end of April. Normally, they would emerge a little bit sooner than that. She's by herself. She dug that chamber last fall, and she's, she's simply overwintering in a dormant state by herself, each one, one by one. And usually, they're doing that in a wooded area. Uh, we know very little about their overwintering because it's so hidden, um, but a wooded, north-facing slope is often um, a spot. It has to be a place where she can actually dig in the soil and get underground a few inches, make that little chamber, and go into dormancy. So in about April this year, I think the first, um, the first ones were seen toward, more toward the end of April in our area. She emerges, and then she begins, the, she, she has to do, uh, start the colony all by herself. So she's once that single, those single queens that have mated and were hatched last summer and mated last summer and were dormant all winter are now ready to um, start the colony. So she, she can create wax from her body. She creates some little wax cups like this that uh, she puts nectar in. So she can store a little bit of nectar within the colony area to, um, within the colony space to subsist on if, say, there's a late snowstorm or bad rainstorm or something like that, a really cold period. Because she's out during April and May when things can be pretty dicey in terms of the weather. What she has to do is find pollen. and Pollen will be the food that she'll feed the young and nectar for herself to um, give her energy. So here she's created a wax brood cell and the egg the eggs are laid within that, and she provisions it with a big ball of pollen. So at this time of year, where, she's, where they're out right now, getting pollen, probably apple trees, pr uh, plum, wild plum, the, the woodland wildflowers, if any of those are still in bloom, like Dutchman's breeches and uh, some of those. As the season moves on, it'll be more like water leaf and uh, raspberries and blackberries that she'll be collecting from. So the action in, the, there's some prairie plants that she could use probably in, um, in the spring if they're present. Um, but she's gathering the pollen and she sits on that brood and she kind of warms it with her um, flight muscles. She can disconnect her, you know, she can, she can vibrate her flight muscles and keep that egg cell warm, that brood cell warm, like a chicken does. She's continuing to lay eggs and keep them warm until the colony 
looks a little bit larger. This is still kind of small looking. But she's raising this first group of worker bees. And all the bees that are, um, that are hatched at first will be females, female workers. And the female workers will then go out and forage. And af after she has raised maybe 30 of them or so in the first month or so of that colony, she can stay in the nest and they can do the foraging. So now you have 30 little bees doing the foraging, bringing back, and you can see how the colony could get bigger and bigger as she continues to lay eggs. And so for the first half of the summer, we're doing this building phase of the colony. It may build up to uh, several hundred bees, uh, about maybe a thousand. It's in a, a pretty small space. They, they usually are an equivalent of a space about this big. Um, but it could be in a rock wall, it could be in a foundation, it could be in a compost pile. They're very opportunistic about where they nest. Um, and chipmunk holes are a big favorite. That's, uh, so if you have chick chipmunk holes, they'll, and the chipmunks or ground squirrels aren't done with them yet, they could be a little bit of a, you know, disconnect, but, but they will, and if their, nest, if their nest is advanced and it gets ruined, uh, then that's the end of the line for her. If it gets ruined when it's early on, uh, she will try again, but now some of the resources have been lost, so it probably won't grow to as big of a colony. The second half of the summer, so, so far we've only had queens and females. That's a really great time to learn your bumblebees because you only have to think about the color patterns of the queens and the females. Now, in the middle of the summer, uh, July or so, end of July, um, middle of July, then we go into the reproduction phase. So from three going up to four there, uh, that is the reproduction phase. So the colony will switch. She may still be producing some workers, but she'll also be laying eggs that she doesn't fertilize, and those become males. And she lays some eggs that, she, that are fertilized that get extra nutrition, and those are the future queens. So here we see on that thistle, or whatever flower that is, um, a future queen and a male mating. So mating will be late in the summer. And then after the mating, the future queen will feed a little bit, but then she'll pretty, pretty soon after that go into her, she'll dig her little chamber and go into her dormancy. That can happen in September, October. She doesn't wait until winter to do it, but she does it after she's mated and ready to go into the next phase. Uh, all of the bees, except for those future queens who are now safely, hopefully safely in hibernation, are, will die. So the original queen, all the workers, the males. They don't make it through the following year. So how do, how do you, um, there's, there's the best way that I can think of, especially in areas where the rusty patch bumblebee is present or could be present, um, is photography. The bees, won't, the bees won't mind you getting up close with them, uh, taking pictures of them like that, or even further away. If you have a longer lens, you can just keep back from them. Um, Bumblebee Brigade is the website that I encourage you to explore, and I'll have more on that later. Uh, what are the things we can find out besides which bees they are? Uh, from photographs. We can find out some uh, interesting things about behavior. Here's a rusty patch bumblebee, um, and she's on Monarda there, uh, and she's nectar robbing on Monarda. So you can see she's got her tongue poked through the lower part of the tube of the Monarda flower, and she's just taking the nectar directly. And that's called nectar robbing because all the other bumblebee species on Monarda will take it through, go through the tube. So they're flying, coming to the Monarda, coming into the tube, backing up, da da. What Rusty Patch usually does when the Monarda's bloomed out like that about halfway, she just lands on top and walks around, poking, poke, 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 poke. So um, it is an interesting um, behavioral difference for, that I've noticed. Sometimes the common, e I've seen the common Eastern do the same thing, but I think they were using the same holes as the rusty patch had already made. And uh, honeybees will also follow along and use the same holes from, uh, that a rusty patch already made. We can look at the uh, emerging, when do those future queens emerge? When are they coming out of the nests? When do we see them out and about? And um, 
than overwintering. When do the overwintering ones emerge? So looking at timing and then the nesting behavior, this is a huge area of research right now because both overwintering and nesting are very hidden and people don't necessarily have a lot of good information about that. So especially with rusty patch bumblebee, since the listing there's been an upsurge of research and particularly about nesting. So if you found a bumblebee nest, you can also report that on um, Bumblebee Brigade, and the, if it's a rusty patch nest, there will be people uh, probably flocking to contact you and see if they can um, study the nest more carefully. They don't damage the nest, they just um, make observations until the nest is finished, as we know it ends at the end of the season, and then they might excavate it and get um, genetic material and so forth to um, learn more about it. We also look at this floral resource uh, use or partitioning. That's kind of what I was talking about before where, uh, well, here's a rusty patch bumblebee visiting jump seed, which isn't a particularly, you know, it's not a plant that automatically makes you think about <laughs> pollinator use, but uh, it was. and we can look at different species because we have our photographic record. We have the bee species, we have the flower species, and those records then, as you have hundreds and hundreds and thousands of them, can show patterns within the um, bumblebee's use. So the, we know now that we have 13 bumblebee species at the Arboretum. That's what we've documented. So it's, um, I would not have guessed when he asked us, you know, like, when he asked us, have you seen any more Rusty Patch, I, would not have, I wouldn't have even known how many to say we have this many at the Arboretum. But now we do uh, know so far that we have that. Um, and so here are three of the most common ones, the common eastern, the two spotted, and this is the brown belted here at the right. The two spotted refers to those two little, do you see the two little um, yellow spots on the, on the abdomen of that bee? There's two little yellow, it looks like a little yellow W, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Like the the right there. Because people are always looking for a black spots, and it's really, the two spots are yellow. And, and so that's the pattern. The very early bumblebee, so if chances are that one's out and about, that one will probably be the first one that you see workers for. So far, I don't think anyone has made any observations of workers out yet, just queens. So those bigger bees are the queens. But when you see little ones, it might be that species first because that's always, that's been, uh, in my experience, always the earliest one, uh, one of the earliest ones to come out. And then the brown belted is here um, at the right on a rose. These are less common ones, um, but still fairly common. So the red belted at the left, this is the half black uh, bumblebee in the middle and the uh, black and gold over here on the right. And that's the biggest one that we have. So it's even the, even the workers of that one are fairly large size. Uh, the half black bumblebee tends to be small, but I always associate it with a for, more forested area. So I'm guessing that I, I, I forgot to look back at my, uh, several years ago I was here at KBR and I, um, did a bumblebee survey, photo survey here, and it was late in the season. I can't, I, I should have looked up which species I found on that survey, because that would just be like the starter set, and then you would add to that and on and on. But um, get out there, and I'm pretty sure that you'll see that half black bumblebee uh, for sure, because this is just the kind of habitat that it is thriving in. And then the less common ones, um, and the one there on the is the one there on the lower left is a yellow banded bumblebee, and that's a queen of the yellow banded bumblebee. And this was at the arboretum, and my uh, students actually took that picture right in their early day. Uh, uh, two of my students who were just learning their bumblebee ID in the first few weeks of work, and when they came, they we, we take pictures. We take a sequence of pictures of a single bee. We take a spacer picture and continue on. So they came in with their photo, the, the, the cameras, and I said, well, did you see anything different? You know, because like they were just learning and I didn't want to be on their, you know, right on their shoulders, at their shoulders while they were doing that. So they weren't very confident. They said, well, I don't think we saw anything quite different than we've already seen. And I opened the photo stream and there was that bee. And it was a queen of a bee that's a northern bee. So. I was like, wow, so this is a very, a very unusual, but if it's a queen, it's been nesting 
at the Arboretum, but just very rarely. And uh, here she was, and then just to have the students be the one that discovered it was just so ma amazing. Um, so this is the yellow banded. It's actually, uh, it was a bee that was being considered for endangered species status a couple years ago. And they determined that there's enough of them, or you know, not not quite. It's not quite endangered if you consider the populations up north. It's more of a northern bee. So interesting. We're at the Madison's like the very edge of its range, but I don't know about here. Take it, check it out. Uh, here's the rusty patch in the middle there. That's on a little lawn clover. And here's the yellow bumblebee. Just a gorgeous um, bumblebee. It's yellow almost all the way down its um, abdomen. Here's the rusty patch bumblebee, the spring queen there uh, at the top. Um, that might look like a crummy picture, but what I needed uh, that picture for and what's definitive about it is that little part right at the back of the head where it meets the thorax, the yellow thorax, is black. That vertex is black, and that's the characteristic that I needed. So that is a definitive picture of rusty patch queen, even though it looks like a crummy picture. Um, here's the female worker. She's carrying a pollen load. Uh, working on the honeysuckle, but here's the pollen right here. So they get the pollen on their body, they groom it onto their legs and pack it on, and that's how they carry it. Only the females will do that, so you'll never see a male be um, carrying pollen around. Here's that rusty patch female again later in the summer. There's a male um, sitting on my finger, and, and that was before, first of all, it was way before they were declared endangered, so I wouldn't have been handling it then. Uh, but you can see what the bee is doing. It's raising its middle leg up toward the camera, kind of up away. That is a signal from bumblebees. If you see a bumblebee doing that, uh, I know now that's a message from them that you're too close. So you just back off, and uh, it'll put its leg down, hopefully, and then you'll know you're far enough back. Um, of course, it was, you know, I was holding it. Male bees don't sting, so that's how that was possible. Um, I, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, these are two fall gines or fresh uh, future queens that are out. She's on a native thistle, so in August or so you can see them as early as that. Or later in September, this one was at the end of September. Um, this was this bee right here was the first time, this, this picture was in pretty big demand because no one had a recent picture of a queen it, no one had a picture of a queen, living queen. They had like pinned specimens. But this one was at the Arboretum that first year we were documenting. And so this one ended up, this picture and some others from the Arboretum ended up going into the uh, book, Bumblebees of North America, because no one else had any pictures of that bee. Here's what the rusty patch bumblebee looks like in a very clear picture with the wings out of the way, uh, just a lucky shot. But this shows the characteristic that you're looking for um, when you're identifying it. It's not a hard bee to identify. Here is the first abdominal segment here, and here's the second segment. So it's yellow segment, but it has this rusty patch toward the front of the bee. You'll always see that little, that little um, fringe of yellow um, pile or hairs toward the back of the bee. If you don't see that, if you just see black toward the back of the bee, then it's a different kind of bee. So um, there is, and the, see on the thorax there, it has kind of a band and then a, a point coming back toward, you know, there's kind of a little, it, this is not on every rusty patch, but if you see this pattern, you, you're going to want to make further investigation to see if it's a rusty patch. And here's that, that vertex is up here, so it's not really clear on this bee, but there's no yellow hairs up on the head of that bee. So that's another good characteristic. Here's the worker, um, another uh, this picture of um, the back view and the side view that can both be helpful. Here is the male. And the males um, don't actually collect pollen and carry it back. So you see them kind of dusty, and the pollen of Liatris is kind of a white. So it just that makes the bee look a little bit like dustier, I guess, is the way I would describe it. But the males have the same abdomen pattern as the females that I just showed you. You might have noticed on the queen there was no rusty patch. Kind of interesting. I've seen pin specimens that have it, but in life I've never seen it. So on her second segment she's just 
it's just plain yellow, plain yellow. And then that black vertex, very important here. And um, if you have the, the, the one that you could confuse a queen with then is the half black bumblebee. And that's where you'd want a picture of the face of the bee. I'll show you that in a second. Because the rusty patch has a, a shorter face, a shorter, um, when you look at it from the front, it's not as triangular. And the um, half black bumblebee has a very long malar space or a long face. Here are the species that are the most easily confused with the rusty patch. So there's the tricolor at the top there on the left. That, uh, this picture is from um, Fort McCoy. So a little further north, um, and you can see it has a rusty area, but those like two rusty segments, and it has that little point that I just pointed out. So, you know, just be on your toes. <laughs> but this one has yellow first segment, orange, orange, and another yellow. So it's got a lot more color on the body than the rusty patch will have. Here's the black, uh, the brown belted, sorry, and that one has a rusty patch there on the second segment, but then it's surrounded by black uh, up here on the upper right. Brown belted. That is probably the one that I get the most pictures of uh, saying, hey, look, I found a rusty patch. So just be aware of that. This is the red belted bumblebee. It's got a lot of red. This is the most variable bumblebee that we have. So there's dozens of color patterns for this one. It's the most complicated one. Uh, but you see, you know, people see this and they go, okay, rusty patch, I got it. But it's not quite the same. And that one's the little half black bumblebee. And you see a little dark uh, segment there on, or on the second segment, you see some dark uh, features. But that is really just the integument of the bee. You're kind of seeing through the yellow hairs and it, kind of, it can kind of fool you. So those are the easily confused ones. What are features of good bumblebee habitat? You want diverse flowers. You want abundant flowers, so lots of different kinds and lots of them. That's basically it. Um, mix, if you're doing seed mixes, you want to emphasize forbs in it a little bit more maybe than a traditional mix would have, maybe be a little heavier on grasses. Um, and you've got to think about when you're managing an area, if you're managing, say, a prairie area, and you're, say, burning it really often and you have a lot of uh, warm season grasses, you may be pushing that area a little more toward the grasses with that management regime. So there's just a lot of things to consider as, you, as you're thinking about um, pollinator habitat. I'm not saying don't burn, I'm just saying you might look at the frequency, you might look at the, the spacing and the uh, distribution of the burns and the species that are in the mix. You want blooming plants from early in the season, like now or earlier than now for those crucial queen development time, to late in the season when those new queens are getting provisioned and you know, just feeding a little bit and then getting into their uh, overwintering. Um, suitable nest sites. Lots of times people are busy, you know, manicuring and like clearing up uh, if they have a rock pile or a log pile or, you know, something kind of a little messy border or something like that in the yard. They're like cleaning that up and it's best to just kind of leave it, like leave buffer areas. I mean, a place like this, we don't have to talk about that too much because we've got it, we've got nature right around us and we can just, um, you know, we know that these sites are available for, for them. But, you know, people are often, maybe even filling in chipmunk holes, and, and especially if the bees are already nesting and you're filling in the chipmunk holes. Uh, that happened accidentally once while we were um, gardening one time. And the queen bee, it was a black and gold bumblebee, she came back to a place and she flew around like an area like this with a pollen load, and she was a big queen. And we we're like, uh-oh, because we had been you know, edging or you know, weeding or whatever. And one of, my, one of my volunteers took his shovel and he scraped along the edge of the sod there. And she zeroed in on a much smaller area. She came down and she just sat on, a, on an old plant, just stayed right there within like six inches of, you know, a six inch area. And I took the little digger and I, I scraped along the same spot and the hole opened and she went right in. 
So I was like, oh my gosh, that was a close call. Um, so don't fill in the chipmunk holes. We, we did it accidentally. Uh, overwintering sites. This would be areas that you're kind of surprising. It's not necessarily the habitat that the flowers are in. It might be a shaded, wooded spot of, of some distance. Uh, one of my colleagues actually found a rusty patch bumblebee overwintering queen when he was doing soil sampling for his jumping worm project in the woods. This is like a half a mile away from any floral resource, a summer floral resource. And he put the soil core in as a tube like this, and he lifted it out, and normally the soil comes out in a chunk. It fell out and he saw the bee, and he took a few pictures of it, and he knew it was an overwintering bee. He put it all back, hope, like, hope things go well. Uh, and he sent me the pictures and said, do you think, don't you think this is a half black bumblebee queen? And I said, well, it's either that or it's a rusty patch. Let's ask the experts, and it was a rusty patch. I mean, the chances of that are zero, but there it happened. So we don't know much about that, but overwintering sites, it was a north-facing slope, it was in the woods, and it was way far away from the flowers that the bee would have been using in, before she went into her um, dormancy. Um, no insecticides, especially the systemic ones, the ones that are in the plant tissue. Some of these are used in production of the plants. So the nursery will treat the plants, do a soil drench, uh, or the seeds are treated, and then the plants have the insecticides within them. That goes into the flowers, it goes into the nectar, it goes into the pollen. So if you're buying plants from a native plant nursery, you're not going to have that issue. But if you're buying them elsewhere, you might want to ch double check into that if they're being treated with um, insecticide in production. So a few um, plants. These are ones that are blooming now, um, prairie plants. I'm going to just do a quick um, trip through some of the plants that uh, bumblebees are using uh, throughout the year. So here are the, um, I grouped these two together. They're both prairie plants, the prairie smoke and the shooting star. They both have this pendulous flowers that hang down and um, the bumblebees come in underneath and can uh, buzz pollinate this flower. So they, um, they vibrate the flower and the pollen drops down. You can see the pollen kind of dropping down on the bee and then she can groom it off of her, uh, off of her body and put it onto the pollen basket. This bee looks like it's about ready to head back to the colony because that's a pretty full load of pollen. Sometimes you see them with an extra load of, extra large load of pollen and then one of them falls off. So like they're only carrying, like they just took too much and <laughs> have to fly kind of lopsided. Uh, both of these plants, after the flowers are, are pollinated, they, um, the the stem of the flower tips upward, and in the case of prairie smoke, you have the uh, seed dispersal there on the, that flowery, that feathery stuff at the top are the uh, styles of the, each flower, that, um, which is where the pollen landed at the end and then traveled down. So those extend and give you that smoky-like look, and those are all connected to the fruits, and that's how they disperse. In the shooting star, it's a little different. They, they do tip up. Here's one of them that's already in its vertical position. It's a capsule, and it opens at the top just um, with a little opening, so you have to like shake those out like a little um, salt shaker when the seeds are mature. Another flower, this is in our Black Oak Savannah garden, um, the, another, another flower that the uh, bumblebees are visiting right now is the wild lupin. And that is uh, from the pea family. So the pea family has a, this bilaterally symmetrical flower I'm sure you're familiar with. And it actually has to be kind of, a, a bee has to kind of manipulate that and kind of trigger it. And then, the, um, and, and then they can actually pollinate it. So like a little tiny bee won't be able to do that, but the bumblebees work the flowers very effectively and, um, and are pollinating those right now. A little later in the season, we're going to see the milkweed uh, come out. I just like this um, picture of the contrast of the butterfly weed with the uh, white sage um, in our dry mesic prairie garden. Here we have um, what looks like a solid field of monarda. Uh, this is a great time to be out there. It's kind of the 
the peak time for bumblebees to be, like there's probably, I don't know, in this picture, if, if we were there in person, there'd probably be mm, 100 bumblebees for us to <laughs> take pictures of and to learn. Um, but there's also other plants in this garden. It's just that at the blooming season for Monarda, and this was kind of early on in this garden's uh, life, this Monarda was very, very prominent. It's, a, it's really attractive to um, a lot of pollinators. So we have also black-eyed Susan in there, purple cone, uh, pale purple cone flower, and a lot of other asters and other plants too that just aren't as obvious. Here, um, just to focus in on, on bee balm or Monarda for a moment, um, we do have, I, I mentioned the other bumblebees. Here's a two-spotted bumblebee visiting the flowers of Monarda, kind of going in through the tube. You can see they're just using the, the tube, the, that entire tube of the flower for pollination. And there's the rusty patch doing its nectar robbing. There's also, so those are, um, Monarda is visited by many of the bee groups, other native bees and butterflies, beetles and wasps. And it is, the plant is a larval host for some moth species as well. So larval host is an important feature for uh, some of the pollinators that we don't, we, we don't think of that with bumblebees because they're eating pollen in the nest, but, but a lot of um, other pollinators will be out on plants when they're young. This is a specialist of Monarda. It's a little tiny, tiny black bee um, called Deforio monardi, and it's only out for a short period of the year when the Monarda is blooming. And it's collecting, it's out there on the very tip of the uh, stamen there, collecting pollen off of the anther. And you can see the pollen is white. It's uh, got some collected already. And this is a solitary bee, so she's just collecting that pollen to take it back to feed that pollen to, uh, to provision eggs that she's laying for um, her reproduction. And this is in our, um, uh, one of our rain gardens, our little rain garden. We have the angelica, which is already past uh, blooming and is in seed here. This is a biennial plant, that tall brownish looking one, reddish brown. Uh, so that's a member of the carrot family. It looks like this the first year, right here, just a, pretty big <laughs> rosette there, uh, like this. And then it gets to be, oh, like it can be eight feet tall. I have seen bumblebees using that, that plant. It'd be blooming pretty soon in terms of the time of year that we're in right now. And then of course it's in seed by midsummer when this picture was taken. Here we have the common bone set and the um, uh, red milkweed or swamp milkweed. And the, the red milkweed, uh, just to give you a close up of this, um, all the milkweed flowers uh, have this form with a very specialized uh, structure and a very specialized pollination system. So each flower there has, uh, you can see the, the thing that the pollinators are super interested in is each of these uh, little, well, they're shaped like cups there, are full of nectar. And this milkweed is visited by tons of plants, I mean, tons of insects. They can just go and drink the nectar out of those cups. But in between each of those cups, there's a little uh, place where two little um, pollen packets are connected together with a filament and a little uh, connector at the top. And so to pollinate this plant, you need to have a fairly strong insect that can get its feet stuck on that little connector and pull out those pollen packets from where they're housed uh, between those cups. So um, in a story of connection, we uh, find, of course, we all know that monarchs require milkweed for their caterpillars. They lay their eggs as the, there's a monarch laying eggs on common milkweed. And then the caterpillars use the milkweed. That's their only food they have. Uh, different species are, are used, but that's the only group that they can use, the only, only uh, genus they can use. And um, then the caterpillars, of course, the chrysalis and the monarchs uh, emerge as adults. So the adult monarchs would definitely visit milkweeds for nectar, um, and so do a lot of other butterflies and other insects. So here's another little butterfly there. There's probably some other little insects on that picture that I can't see. But with the pollination, this is what we're seeing. Uh, these are golden things here hanging down, 
are the pollen packets. This bee is a um, golden northern bumblebee, um, Bombus borealis, and it has been at a milkweed. Um, it's in flight right now, but it, it has been at a milkweed and is carrying those pollinia with it. Hopefully it goes back to a milkweed and those little pollinia have to slide into those tiny slots on the flower. Um, because it's such a specialized type of pollination system, only bumblebees and probably large wasps are the main pollinators for milkweed, not monarchs. So butterflies are not really strong enough to, you, you might see a monarch with one or two of those. I mean, I, I think that's been seen before. I've seen an ant carrying one of the pollinia, but in general, and for the most part, it's going to be these large pollinators. So think about the system. I mean, that's how the milkweed seeds are getting produced. I know common milkweed spreads a lot by rhizomes, of course, but uh, some of the others don't. They spread by seed only or mainly. And so we need to have these pollinators present in order to um, keep the milkweed going and keep the milkweed uh, producing, especially with the emphasis now on planting more milkweed and planting more milkweed from seed. This is how it's going to be um, produced. There's not a way to just like brush the pollen from one to the other in this plant. Of course, monarchs need other um, plants for nectaring because the milkweed is only really blooming for a small amount of time, it, like it's not blooming yet. So they're using other, the monarchs that are back are now using other nectar sources. And then late in the season, this is their, this is in my observations, their favorite plant, meadow blazing star. So um, if you have any of that, you, I mean, if you have any of that growing and blooming in your garden, try to get the monarchs off of it. It will, it will not be easy, they will, they will stick to it. Late in the season, we get into the asters and the goldenrod. So here are some asters. The um, silky aster, a really beautiful small plant for like rock gardens, gravel gardens, and so forth. Um, it, is, it has fairly large flowers. The flowers are like the size of a New England aster, but the plant itself is pretty small. Wiry stems and really soft little leaves there which is where its name comes from. New England aster is probably the, one of the last species to be blooming uh, in the season, and it's a, incredibly important for like the, the migrating mo monarchs, the bumblebees at the end of the season, other pollinators, and other um, insects. And one other plant that I love to mention for bumblebee pollination is this one, the bottle gentian. So the bottle gentian's here in full bloom. That one there at the top with the whitish, uh, with the white little circle at the top is the one that's probably the most actively in bloom right now. These ones with the purple tops have already been pollinated, but what these, this plant has is, that's, that's as far as the, the flower opens. These petals are pleated and um, they're folded. So what has to happen is a bumblebee comes to that top opening and presses itself within and opens those pleats up and gets inside and the pleats to shut back, uh, cover it back up. And then it roams around in there, pollinates, and then it comes popping back out. And the pleats just cover, come back together again and uh, close up. So that's why the pollinated ones there with the purple tops just look just like the other ones. Um, inside there's a capsule that develops then and has hundreds and thousands and I don't even know how many seeds, tiny seeds in each of those flowers. So this is a really nice plant. It needs a little bit of moisture or uh, areas that have a little more moisture. Um, you might, if you're in nature, you might find it more stream side or like wetter areas, wet mesic areas. Okay. To talk about a couple of, and just, this is a little bit of a review from what I mentioned before, but um, just gardening practices kind of um, illustrated here. So we want to maximize the number of diversity of native plants in landscape. This is an early spring picture, uh, probably past, uh, in Madison we're a little past this point now, maybe here we're still at this point, um, but it shows a diversity of the spring wildflowers, and spring wildflowers are going to be pretty important for uh, bumblebees during, the, during their time when they're emerging. There aren't a lot of prairie plants and open 
area plants that are producing pollen and nectar at this time. So we're looking at right now, if we went outside, we'd be looking at the plums, we'd be looking at the apple trees. And of course, we'd be, when you're up in the uh, when they're up in the trees, you can't get very good pictures of them, so look for them on Creeping Charlie. They love Creeping Charlie, and it's on the ground, and you can get great pictures, um, document all your queen bumblebees that way. But bluebells they love. There's, um, there's, they'll visit uh, Spring Beauty. It's not their favorite, but they'll visit it. And then um, the uh, flocks, I don't see them on flocks very much. Flocks is usually um, more of a butterfly-type pollinated. You want a seasonal succession of flowering, as I mentioned before, and you want different flower forms. So different families, different colors, different shapes of the flowers. Here we've got uh, some great bumblebee um, flowers just in this scene. Uh, we've got the blazing star. This is the prairie blazing star this time. And the Joe Pieweed just getting started. That is a terrific uh, bumblebee plant. And Culver's Root, one of their very, very favorites. So this is white spikes here. There's some irises there. And so, of course, by the time this picture was taken, the irises were um, done. But they, bumblebees will use the irises, too. OK. We want to make sure the floral resources start early in the spring and go all the way to the end. So you, you could have a garden where you're really focused on the summer resources, but be sure to taper out to the others. And sometimes it will be a tree species that you want to be thinking about for, say, uh, the plums or the apples for, um, or uh, raspberries, blackberries, and so forth for the early season. This is um, a guide. I just put this in here because uh, it's, it's a screenshot of, of a, a guide that we put together for the Fish and Wildlife Service when Rusty Patch was declared an endangered species in 2017. So at that time, the Fish and Wildlife Service then kind of takes hold of the records. Uh, they, they keep um, good records, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, but they also were, were, creating, were creating a lot of um, outreach materials. So this is a, um, a plant list. And it's a plant list that goes, you can see it's just early March and April, but then it continues on. They are, just have been revising their website and making it um, compliant which meant that a lot of the materials that are on it are like not on it right now. Um, we're working with them to get, you know, they may have to change the way the document looks and all to make it compliant and get it back um, on there. But uh, anyway, there are lots of resources like this for pollinator plantings and pollinator uh, resources. So either um, you can go to pollinator partnership and put your zip code in or a zip code of somewhere where you're gardening if it's not at your home. And you can get plant lists of native plants for that area somewhat similar to this. We had fun with this one because it was um, we, we were challenged to put it on one page and to get all that information about the seasonality and then the habitat type and scientific names and so forth. So uh, we, we met it, but then they took it off the website. So well, if you want a copy of this, uh, email me, and I do have an electronic copy of it. I could uh, send that to you. I also recommend that people plant um, straight species. So this means just the native wild type species. Instead of a highly developed or possibly um, altered uh, cultivars, nativars, etc. Now, I'm not saying that all cultivars and nativars are not valuable for pollinators, but you can actually, but I would encourage you to actually uh, make the observations to test that or check, the, uh, or check some literature about it. I know for the Joe Pie weeds, there have been some studies done comparing the cultivars to the wild types or straight species to see which ones are visited by pollinators more, which ones are use, used by pollinators more. And they found that some of the cultivars are actually more, seem to be more attractive than the, the wild type. But in general, that's not the pattern. Here, uh, we have an, in Madison a demonstration garden, but the Ag School has a demonstration garden out there on West Mineral, on Mineral Point Road. And they have all the baptisias that are all these cultivars of baptisia. So you can go out there and you can take pictures of the bumblebees visiting those. And then this is the white one here is, of course, the wild type, uh, the wild white indigo. 
Um, and so, you know, I mean, it's, it doesn't tell you anything about the nutritional value to the bees, but it does tell you if they're visiting. And if, if there wasn't any resource there at all, they wouldn't visit it. So you can see cultivars sometimes where it looks to me and you just like the plant that it's a cult, that it's a, you know, the native plant, but no insects will visit it. So on those, in that case, I'm kind of going to go with the, I'm going to go with the wild type. Here's the, just that warning about the pesticides again. Um, make sure the nursery plants that you get are not pre-treated. You can ask about that. If they don't know, then I think uh, you know, consumer pressure will, will help this, um, but it's going, to take, it's going to take a lot of people asking and a lot of people pressuring. Uh, these are from a native plant nursery, so we don't have that concern. This is a rain garden mix from that. Here's uh, the suggestion about the logs and the rocks, uh, keeping leaf litter around, having some buffer areas just available. Uh, and I also encourage people not to use really heavy, heavy loads of mulch or landscape fabric with the mulch on top because then the bees can't go in and they can't, and if they're underground, they can't come out. And this is not just for bumblebees, but for a lot of the other bees that use soil uh, their ground nesting. And if you plant the plants really densely, you really don't need mulch. The plants will fill it in and their root systems will um, perform the same um, function. Protecting and do documenting the nests and overwintering sites. There's the picture that my colleague took of uh, the bee that he found. So that's an overwintering giant. She was, it was in November, so she was a little bit, she wasn't like, completely, she moved, you know, she moved a little bit. She wasn't completely like motionless dormant. This is a picture of a brown belted bumblebee uh, nest that's in where basswood trees were growing in a clump. And that was a mouse nest in between there. Someone had put a log up against it. So I had just moved the log and then I noticed that the uh, bees had taken over the mouse nest and were coming like out of there. And a uh, brown belted is, probably the more aggressive of all of the bumblebee species that I know. So when I see brown belts kind of getting upset, I like to take, I like to get out of there. <laughs> Otherwise, a bumblebee nest looks really obscure, just like a hole in the ground and the leaves. And you, you might not know that it's a nest. You've got to watch to see how they're coming and going. And when the workers are there, you'll see mo much more activity. So you could be sure it's a nest. If you see bees coming with pollen and going in, then it's a nest. Um, we leave the material standing over the winter and we trim it in the spring. In some cases, we use prescribed fire. Um, so we don't burn everything, of course, and we don't burn next to our building. That's the mm. rules. But we do this rain, this rain garden, um, the rain garden that's right. Uh, I, I don't like to burn this garden right here, but there's a rain garden right here. It's 30 meters in uh, diameter. And then these gardens were burned this year, too. We burn that one off, too. And that... Um, just stimulates the prairie plants and stimulates the wetland plants as well. So Wisconsin bumblebees need your help. These are images from the Bumblebee Brigade showing some of the different color patterns, so kind of stylized. Yeah, it is, yeah. And this is just, they're labeled on the website but <laughs> because on, and on the ID sheet. This is just uh, to show you that we have one endangered species in Wisconsin. That's the rusty patch bumblebee there. We have seven species that are of species of greatest conservation need. So these are ones that are either declining or are rare or they're concerned that they are in some kind of, you know, they're, they're paying more attention to those. And then we've got three down here in the bottom that are where we don't, just don't have any information at, at all to know what their status is, where they are, who they are. These are all um, nest parasitic bumblebees. Five of our bumblebee species are nest parasites of other bumblebees. So those would be rarer to find because if the host bumblebee is rare, then the nest parasite that's specific to that host is going to be very, very rare. So uh, seeing a nest parasite is not necessarily a bad thing. It shows that you have healthy populations of the host. So there aren't very many of those that um, that are common. Um, here's how we do it. Document the bumblebees. We upload the photos to Bumblebee Brigade. 
and then you get pictures like those. We've already seen them. Here are the photography tips. So when you get your camera, phone, or whatever you're using, uh, you want to try to get numerous pictures of a single bee. So maybe, I don't know, as you get as you get more experience with it, you'll get a feel for this. I just was, there was this bee working on the verbena, so I just took pictures of her until um, I, you know, I just took a bunch of pictures of her. And then I selected these, so we have a back view there, a side view is helpful, and then this is that face view that I was mentioning before. So here I can see the shape of the face. I can see the feature here, this is called the vertex, that little triangle area there, it's yellow in this case. Um, I could actually see her ocelli, the, these features here, just because of the way the lighting is. Um, so you can see some details that you wouldn't necessarily see from the other views, and that can be helpful. So from those pictures, I was able to ID the bee. This is a lemon cuckoo bee, a female. She's not a queen or anything because she is a nest parasite. Mm -hmm. she, is, uh, she specifically goes into the nests of common eastern and half black bumblebee and um, lays her eggs in there and then those bu bumblebees of the host species will raise her young and she can either go on to other nests sometimes they go though and they actually kill the queen that's in there and they um, and they go on include spacer photos after you have like Maybe take 10 pictures of that individual, then take a picture of the ground or your hand or something, and then continue on. Otherwise, you'll get confused with who's who. Resources to identify, really, you've got the books. Uh, there's a couple books that they're, uh, Bumblebees of North America is kind of the definitive text. Bugguide.net is helpful. Um, that's just on the web. You submit photos, and experts will send you, email you your IDs. With Bumblebee Brigade, you get to uh, ID it yourself, and then experts will verify or correct, depending on um, how your identification goes. Um, there's some other, there's other resources. If you're traveling somewhere that's not Wisconsin, the Xerces Society has Bumblebee Watch, which is the same kind of project, only in, um, in other states. So what you can do at Bumblebee Brigade is join the community science project, submit your photos, take online trainings. We'll have some in-person trainings, so you could watch for those. They'll be ramping that up. They're, they're getting another staff person on board now. Um, learn the IDs, explore the resources, and discover the distributions and statewide patterns. And all the data for Rusty Patch Bumblebee from this website will go to uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is a Fish and Wildlife Service map, a 10-year record of rusty patch sightings um, across the US. So um, you can see that the grade area, it all across here is the historic range. And the red dots are locations with a zone around them. Because if you see a bee, you, you saw it foraging, you don't necessarily know, like, well, is it, you know, it's, it's in a zone that it's living in. And then the yellow is an area around that that indicate the bigger the yellow area around the red is, uh, indicates these, uh, if it's big, it indicates more suitable habitat adjacent to where the sighting was. And so um, you can see how it's filled in, and you can see that where we are right now, kind of right in here. So I really hope this map like, can light up a little more with, um, with more people observing and more people submitting records. Uh, if you submit to Bumblebee Brigade, it gets passed along because Fish and Wildlife Service is the like, hub of all the rusty patched bumblebee data. But it would also be cool to know what are the other bumblebees of this area again. And I'd be glad to, sh uh, as I go home and uh, look up my um, records from this place, I'll be glad to um, send those along to KVR to, so that at least that information from a few years ago is known. You can see that it's mostly lost over all of its range. Uh, Canada, they haven't seen it there now for 12 years, I believe. And it, the last sightings were right in this area of um, Ontario, so um, they're sad about that. Cape Cod had a sighting. So there was a, this is the mountains of West Virginia and Virginia and the Appalachians. Uh, there was a sighting there and then a bunch of researchers like descended on it. And so more figures. Here we've got Madison. 
lots of sightings around there. Milwaukee has had a, a training, so that lit up Forest Preserve of uh, Illinois. This is the Nechusa area there. Twin Cities has a long history of uh, community science and uh, observations, but looks like there's some blank spaces on the map to see if either it's not there or it hasn't been seen there yet. So that's my challenge to you. And I am going to just, I'm way over time, I think, so I'm just going to skip through just to give you a few pictures of the uh, native bees that are not colonial. So here's some ground nesting bees, solitary bees. This is from that big 85% of them that aren't colonial. There's a little sweat bee on different flowers through the season. What's, sorry, what's the color of the upper corner? This one in the upper, up the upper right, that's uh, lopseed, Phryma. Phryma, it's called lopseed. It's a real tiny, that's a real tiny flower, but. So this is just one, one little uh, sweat bee. Here's some cavity nesting bees. These are using hollow stems and crevices. So they put their, they get a ball, they get pollen. She's, she, these are leaf cutter bees there, those, those big ones that are on the, like on the thistle there. She gathers the pollen on her um, abdomen. She brings it back, makes a ball of pollen, lays the egg on it, seals it off within a tube and continues to do that, fill the tube up and then she's, and she's done for that year. And the next year, those will emerge as single males and females and go and continue the cycle. So thank you so much for your interest. And I hope you have a good um, time monitoring bumblebees. Yes. So I have a really basic question. I'm kind of embarrassed to ask it. Oh, no, no. Uh, what distinguishes a bumblebee from other bees? OK. What makes a bumblebee a bumblebee? Yeah, the bumblebee is, yeah, um, so the question is what makes a bumblebee a bumblebee? So bumblebees are, um, they're, they have, uh, I mean, for, for like, if you're just observing them, they're going to have quite a bit of pile or hairs. They have the, usually are, you have the yellow and black um, patterns, you know, to them. Uh, now, sometimes, that's especially toward the end of the season or say this is actually a good example of a bee. See how shiny this is right here on the thorax? If you see shininess on a bumblebee, it is just the pile worn off. Um, so yeah, the pi pile is just another name for the hairs, yeah. Um, and so if you see a bee that sort of looks like a bumblebee, like it has brownish, and then it has a real shiny abdomen, pure shiny abdomen, that's actually a carpenter bee. So it, it wouldn't have pile over its whole, a carpenter bee doesn't have pile over its whole body. But sometimes you'll see a worn, a worn space, especially at the end of the season, because the bees have been out so much, they, their wings get tattered, and, they're, and they lose pile, and then they look kind of, old and bedraggled, but um, so yeah, they're, they're going to have, uh, so to distinguish them from, I mean, wasps would have very little, they don't have hairs at all. Uh, some of those other little bees that I showed you there, like the, uh, like the um, sweat bees, they don't have any hairs either. Um, so bumblebees really, that's one of the main, that would be one of the main characteristics of them. Um, and then some bumblebees, I didn't include any pictures of it here, but uh, some flies are bumblebee mimics. So it looks like a bumblebee. It has the same, like, you know, it looks the same colors. But when you look carefully, you see that it has really huge eyes like a fly has. It has very small, short antenna, like spike antenna instead of long antenna as bumblebees have. And it has only two wings instead of four wings. So the bees have four wings, even though it can be hard to see those because they might be o overlapping or, you know, here you can't see, it's not enough contrast to see it. But, um, but if you see a fly, it only has two wings, then you know it's not a bee, even though it, it sort of looks like a bee, it's sort of acting like a bee. And if you get a picture of those, I found it very handy to send those pictures of the bumblebee mimics into uh, bugguide.net and there, there are people there 24 hours a day identifying 
insects. So they'll email you back and tell you what kind of fly it is, which I found helpful because bumblebee people won't know what kind of fly it is. So does that help with Aaron? Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I missed this, but you said that the female workers are not uh, don't don't turn into queen bees. So how does the queen bee develop the queen that's going to be fertilized for the next year's? Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question. And my understanding is that the original queen, when she gives rise to the workers, she she fertilizes the eggs, and so they are deployed and they're females because the way that genetics works in bee, bees is if it's haploid, if it's an unfertilized egg, it'll become a male. Um, and so in, early on in the, in the colony, the queen, the original queen is through uh, like hormonal signals suppressing the reproduction of the, um, suppressing the reproduction of the female workers. If she dies, the female workers can start laying eggs, but they're not, she, they haven't mated, so they're not fertilized, so then it, they're just males produced. This is kind of complicated in terms of that. But then f how does the future queen get made? Um, so later in the season when she's laying, when she's uh, creating those females, um, and I don't think it's completely entirely known, and if it is, it's not completely entirely known by me, um, but extra nutrition for them. And the colony wouldn't produce, like, you know, I said there'd be hundreds of bees in the colony, like the workers, there'd be up to several, several hundred of them possibly. There's not that many future queens produced. So there are fewer of them produced, and they're, um, they have extra nutrition at the end of the season. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Bigger. Bigger. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if there's a difference in like the brood cells, size of the brood cells. It would make sense that there would be. But again, this is why people are. If you find a nest, I and mean, people like especially rusty patch nests, people are descending on, you know, will descend on your location to discuss with you the options for you know, dissecting the nest after it's done and figuring things out. So we've had, I think there have been six nests in detail. Like usually each year there's maybe, throughout the Midwest, there have been like four or five nests each year the last two years that people have found and that have been studied. Not very many. One place that I found a lot of nests would be in a hay or mm -hmm. we actually had some uh, uh, bee boxes, like a red, yep. you know, box. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that, that's what I mean by opportunistic. But, you know, it's funny because people try to make artificial um, bumblebee boxes, you know, for them to use and like and have these tubes, you know, because they'll be like, oh, that's like the hole where they go in and they go back and then they're. And I remember being out in California, actually got, had a chance to go visit uh, the person who got he started on all this, and uh, he took. He showed me uh, this. We went out to the place where the bee researchers were and everything. And I saw one of these boxes, like up in a tree, like just thrown up in a tree. I said, "Well, what's that?" And he goes, "Oh, that's Dr. Thorpe's um, artificial box that someone, you know, wanted him to use." And he he said, it "Just never works." And he so he just threw it up in the tree. <laughs> and it never had bumblebees in it. <laughs> Yeah, there are so the stressors for bumblebees and like uh, uh, why are they why are some declining and others maybe not declining? Um, so there are the stressors basically for the whole I mean for pollinators in general, but especially for bumblebees would be uh, habitat loss and fragmentation. So to counteract that, you know the the gardening and the connecting of habitats is important. They are central place foragers, so they, once that nest is established, they have to go back to it. There, there's no way for them to like set up shop somewhere over here. Like it's the, the females have to do that. 
um, the males don't. The males can leave the nest and keep going, and, it, and that's the way that genetic variation would happen because this, these, they just need food so they can follow food in a connected way and encounter other female colonies and then that you'll be outcrossing instead of inbreeding with their own group. Um, so habitat loss and, and fragmentation, um, climate change, because they are cool weather animals, bumblebees are, and so heating is very deleterious to them. Like, so these heat waves, and I was just reading an article yesterday about this uh, where they were testing um, what the limits of, you know, or what the effects of high heat exposure to even relatively short periods of high heat were to bumblebees. They, they, uh, it affects their cognition, it affects their, their wayfinding and their memory. So it's not a good thing. D disease and pathogens and pest, you know, like parasites are an issue. Um, and pesticides. Again, pesticides, it, it comes back to that again. So some of those factors would individually be a problem, but then they can combine as well, the interactions of those. So a colony that's stressed because of poor habitat and has to travel a long distance to get food and is, has less nutrition just overall, and then they're exposed to insecticides, that's, you know, two things operating together that are... are they don't go. They won't go miles and miles if they don't have to. The best thing, you know, the best thing, the guideline is to have good uh, floral resource, you know, within. Um, like they'll travel. They can travel economically, if you will, for about a mile from their nest. So if there was a nest, you know, in one location, you know, the, the resource is going to change over time in the season too. So like at the arboretum, we have. Uh, the woodlands, and we have early resource, but we also have the prairie. So, you know, the, you won't find the bees in the woods except for overwintering, about possibly nesting. In the summer, you'll find them in the prairie because they, they can travel that far. But they usually say about a mile is like ideal. They will travel longer than that if they have to, but then they're using a lot of energy to get there and get back, and that energy is being, you know, that, that just reduces the fitness of the whole colony, so. Any other questions? Okay, good, well thank you, thanks so much.